school at Harding, Leslie and I traveled to, for a semester to Greece, um, which was cool for a lot of reasons, and one that I thought it would be cool but actually wasn't was because I had had like three semesters of ancient Greek. And so I thought that I'd be able to show that off a little bit since I knew the language, except, you know, that was like the Greek that the Bible was written in and not the modern day Greek. And plus, I didn't do that well in my Greek classes at Harding, but nobody else needed to know that. And so within the first week of us all being there, me and Leslie and some of the friends that had gone with us to school uh, were at this like, you know, hole-in-the-wall cafe that does not have a lot of tourists. So the menus are all in Greek, but, you know, I've had three semesters of this stuff, and so while everybody else is having to ask the waiter to translate, I'm going to show off my kind of, you know, scholarship by being able to just read it on my own. The, thing, the problem is the menu was, you know, Greek to me. So... But I do see one word in there that I recognize, pig. I'm like, yeah, I know that's pig, and I like ham and bacon and stuff like that. So I just point at the waiter, and I'll have, I'll have this. So he goes off, and he makes it and brings all our food back, and everybody else has, you know, like gyros and what normal Americans eat when they first go to Greece, except my plate is totally different than everybody else's, and I taste it, and it's awful. It's so, so bad. But I'm going to power through this because I am not letting everybody know that I did not know what I was doing when I ordered. And eventually, Leslie's like, can I have a bite of your meal? And I was like, no, babe, no, this is, uh, you, you wouldn't like this. This is something that I really like, but you wouldn't like this. And she was like, let me just have a taste. And so she tasted it, and she's like, oh, that's awful. I said something about her just not appreciating different cultures. But she wasn't buying it. So she got, called the waiter over, and she goes, what did this man order? And that's when he said, oh, um, he ordered fried pig intestines. <laughs> Which is not what I thought I was eating this entire time. You know, I'm trying to impress my friends. Meanwhile, I just have eaten half a plate of an abomination in the book of Leviticus. <laughs> <clears throat> Today, I want to talk about what we eat and why we eat. Because the Bible has a lot to say about our table etiquette. In the beginning... When God created the heavens and the earth, everything had its right and proper place. And there was this proper relationship between us and God and us and each other. But you remember how Genesis says this whole thing went off the rails? In Genesis 3 verse 6, here's what it says. The woman sees that the fruit of the tree, the one that God said to Adam and Eve not to eat, when the woman sees that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. <clears throat> then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they're naked. So they sew fig leaves together, and they make coverings from them for themselves. God said, can you trust me? You can eat anything you want. Just don't eat from this one tree, which is God's way of asking, can you trust me? And the answer to that question was no. The answer to that question for a lot of us is no. And their eyes are open. Now in the Hebrew world, there's two kinds of seeing. There's the regular kind of seeing that a lot of us are doing here this morning. And then there's the kind of seeing that comes with obedience. And so when it says Adam and Eve's eyes were open, it is in a very real sense here that their eyes were closed. With the first meal in the Bible, you see a one meal that leads to a billion broken hearts. And immediately after this, the world starts to unravel. Adam, God comes to Adam and says, what happened? And Adam uses Eve as a human shield. He immediately blames her in what reads like the first screenplay to an Everybody Loves Raymond episode. And then in a few short verses, they have kids and their kids. One kid rises up and kills the other one. A few short verses after that, this guy named Lamech threatens to kill anybody 70 times seven if they mess with him. There's betrayal and murder and genocide all within the first few verses of this forbidden meal. And at the end of that chapter, chapter 4, the kind of showing the world going off the rails, there's this fascinating verse in, in verse 24 where it says, At that time, the people began to call on the name of the Lord. <clears throat> it's like things started to get bad enough that people realized they needed help beyond themselves. 
that if, some, if something was going to save us, it was going to be someone outside of us acting on our behalf. And we have all kinds of words to talk about that. The human condition, evil, sin. But the big idea, and, and this is not something most of you need explained, is that there is something broken in the world. And it's not just out there in the world. It's inside each one of us. And if you doubt that, you can read the rest of Genesis or you can look in the mirror. Because most of us live with this profound awareness that the world isn't right, that something isn't right. Genesis 3 is written on all of our lives. It's written on our life experiences. It's written in our homes and our families. Hold on to that. So we're going through the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel is a church word for the story of Jesus. And Luke's version of Jesus, he has this, he, the way he tells the story is just brilliant. And today's passage is one of my favorites. It's about resurrection and how the resurrection was never just a cute idea that Christians could believe and talk about in church, but a revolutionary idea that would one day turn the world upside down. It already has turned the world upside down. And if we'll let it, it can turn your world upside down. But before we can go to Luke, there's one other place I want to take you first. Something written by Luke. Luke wrote two books. Luke and what else? Acts. The book of Acts, right? It's the sequel to the book of Luke. But I want to start in this one story towards the end of Acts this morning because most of the Bible is trying to answer the question that we're talking about this morning. The world is broken. How long is it going to be like this, God? How long will there be cancer? How long will there be divorce? How long will there be betrayal? How long will the world be like that? The Bible is filled with this question, like a drumbeat throughout both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, of God's people asking, when are you going to do something? We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And the words the prophets would use to talk about when, the, when God would set the world right, would, they called it the day of the Lord. They said the day of the Lord was going to be when everything was made right. But by the time of Jesus, not everybody liked the idea of the day of the Lord. In fact, there was a whole group of Jewish people who didn't believe in the resurrection or the prophets or the angels. They were a group of Jewish uh, religious leaders. There were the Pharisees were one group, and then another group were the Sadducees. The way you can remember that is they did not believe in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see. That's right. I'm going to make that joke for a decade, so just get used to it now. Um, but they didn't believe in the resurrection. And here's what you need to know about the Sadducees. The Sadducees ran the temple. They were in charge of basically what we would call church back in the day. But they didn't get that honestly. See, the temple was supposed to go to um, only Levites. But when Rome came to power, they basically saw that the temple was a way of making money. And so they sold the temple and the priesthood to the highest bidder. And the Sadducees had money. So they bought it. It was business to them, and business was good. And the Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in the, uh, the prophets. Because the resurrection has and always will be a revolutionary doctrine. These days, people talk about the resurrection as if it is a conservative litmus test for whether or not you are conservative. If you really believe the resurrection, you know that's not a good litmus test. Because the resurrection is God's way of saying the way things are is not the way things will always be. And you might not like the idea of the revolution if your system is working well for you. See, the Sadducees were the conservatives of the Jewish party in their day. And that brings us to the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn with me to Acts chapter 23, starting in verse 1. Paul has just been arrested. He's in charge with, he's in trouble with the Jewish people. Um, uh, and at this point in verse 1, Paul looks straight at the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish kind of religious council, and says, My brothers, I have filled my duty to God in all good conscience this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, and I love this, Paul has got so much Funk. He's so, got so much moxie. He says to the high priest, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who are standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest, to which Paul says, oops, I did not realize he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, and this is brilliant. My brothers, I am a Pharisee. 
descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And when he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided because the Sadducees say that there's no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but <laughs> that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There's a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if, what is a, a Sadducees and Pharisees is not, what a Sadducees not believe in? Angels or spirits. And they're like, nothing's wrong with this man. What if an angel or spirit spoke, and, spoke to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. And he ordered the troops to go down and take them away by force and bring, them, bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, you must also testify in Rome. Does this not sound like a church fight to you? I mean, Paul is brilliant here, right? He knows exactly the room he's in, and just like a surgeon puts his finger on the pressure point. And the, the Pharisees, that, you know, they're not on Paul's side at all. They're just an enemy of my enemy is my friend. And it says, uh, and here's what's so brilliant about this story. The Gospel of Luke, all throughout the Gospel of Luke, the book before this that Luke wrote, he's been really big on us knowing the resurrection is not just a good idea. It's something that if it gets a hold of you, will change your life, your future, and the way you live now. I mean, it's stories like the prodigal son, right? This son of mine, the father says, who was dead and is alive again. It's stories like the rich man and Lazarus. Would you go back and tell my five brothers, this is what happens if you live greedy, a greedy life? There, this, all throughout the Gospel of Luke, there, Jesus is wanting us to know the resurrection is more than just you will live again after you die. That's why the Sadducees don't like it. It's not because they don't understand it. It's because they do understand it. It's not just the doctrine of life after heaven. Although, praise God, that's a part of it. It's something that if you understand, it changes the way you, you live this life now. And that brings us to the Gospel of Luke, the verses that we're in today is in Luke chapter 14, starting <clears throat> with verse 1. Or actually, we're going to start in verse 7 because we did one through six last week. Verse seven, when Jesus, he's at a banquet and he noticed how the guests picked out the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, <coughs> do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all those other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. When I was at Harding, there was this young woman that I thought was very pretty named Alyssa. It's weird telling this story back in Arkansas because some of you may know who Alyssa is, but I thought she was really pretty. And one day... I am um, eating at the cafeteria with her, and I, I'm trying to, you know, throw my homeschool game out there, which was not very strong. But that was not the reason me and Alyssa never really dated. It was because the time that I'm hanging out with her, I'm eating a meal, and I say one of those power syllables, like a p, and a piece of chicken spaghetti flies out of my mouth and lands on Alyssa's lip, <laughs> which... I'm not Dr. Phil, but I do think that's a hard thing to recover in a relationship that's just getting started. Now, when Jesus talks about this, <clears throat> so I know what it's like to be at a meal and lose honor. When Jesus talks about this, it sounds like he's kind of describing a junior high scenario like that. But banquets back in that day were really regulated. There was a person of honor. Actually, in order to do this, I'm going to need four volunteers. Let's, uh, um, okay... Uh, hold on, let me see, I, I need some fellas, shepherds, where's some shepherds? Uh, okay, Brother Jimmy, that was the most timid hand ever. Okay, she's a shepherd, so he's a guest of honor, all right? Guest of honor gets to sit right here. 
Um, Jordan, do you mind? You can, uh, Cooper, you can come too with Jordan. Um, but Cooper, you get to be closer to Brother Jimmy. Jordan right here, and then uh, Jordan, you're going to be right here. And then Kevin, you mind coming? All right, come on up. So here is the banquet. Uh, no, don't put that up there yet. No, you can, it's all right. You can sit down, but just leave that here. You're giving away the big reveal, Jordan. Okay, so banquets back in the day were really regulated. There was a, uh, a, this is what Jesus is getting at. There was a world of who could sit where, and it all related to the guest of honor. That may sound strange, but um, the guest of honor, in an honor-shame society, the guest of honor was the kind of, um, the whole banquet oriented around him. So let me give you an example. There's a guy, a first century Roman historian named Pliny the Younger, who actually wrote a description of an average Greco-Roman banquet back in that day, if you could put that up. Some of the elegant dishes were served up to himself and a few more of the company. This is about the guest of honor, while those which were placed before the rest <coughs> were cheap and paltry. He had a portion in small flagons, three different sorts of wine. But they are, you're not supposed to think that it was the guests that could choose what kind of wine they would drink. On the contrary, that they might not choose at all. For One was for himself and me, and the next for his friends of lower order, and the third for his own slaves and mine. Okay, so basically, he's trying to explain that if you're the guest of honor, it really matters uh, what you feed the guest of honor, and it matters where you sit. So, Cooper, you're getting to sit next to the guest of honor. Now, Brother Jimmy has got, like, chicken and baked potato and asparagus. And since, you know, he's talking about different grades of wine, but since this is church and we're in Arkansas, we're going to do Dr. Pepper. <laughs> you can have that, but after, actually after second service. Um, so... You've got, I love that you're so, you, opportunist, Cooper, you're an opportunist. And then the further away, so Cooper, you get to share this with Brother Jimmy, you get to have Dr. Pepper and chicken, but since you're in the middle, Jordan, you don't get that. Instead, you get, oh, Kevin, you mind scooting up for a second? You get a McDonald's meal and Mr. Pip. Right. I'm aware of the difference. I mean, Dr. Pepper, the guy has his doctorate, right? And Mr. Pibb is just an ordinary guy. You ever go into a restaurant and they're like, we don't have Dr. Pepper, but we do have Mr. Pibb. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, as if. As if those things are equivalent. But you see, he's still got a good meal. And now Kevin, Kevin does not have chicken or McDonald's. He has Spam. And Dr. K. <laughs> yeah, he's got his doctorate, but look, he bought that online and he's not fooling anybody, right? So this is, <laughs> you do have the most to drink. You can, you can share that with Cooper. So this is the way that it would have set, it set up an ancient world. And we listen to that and we think, okay, that's the ancient world. But I would say, is our world any different? So about 10 years ago, I walked into my office at the church I worked at in Fort Worth, and as soon as I walked in, Max Licato was sitting in my office. I grew up in Benton, Arkansas. One of the reasons I wanted to be a preacher was reading Max Licato books. And so when he walked into my office, I immediately nerded out and was as socially awkward as possible. And it just, after a couple minutes, he said something about, hey, like the books that I had in my office. And I looked over there, and I had two Max Licato books and the first thing I said to Max Licato, one of the first things I said to him was, I've got way more of your books at my house. <laughs> so I went to dinner with him and um, uh, Rick Ashley, my former boss at the Hills. And let's say this is Max. This is where Max is sitting. And then there's Rick who's sitting here. And then there is... Uh, um, Steve Green, who's Max's agent. He's also the agent for Michael W. Smith, who I call Smitty because I know his agent now. <clears throat> and then there was a couple of us on the outside. Now, guess where I wanted to sit? Guess where I wanted to sit? I want to sit here, yeah. Guess where I got assigned to sit? I got assigned to sit here. I, I was like, Max, when you go into your Schlotzky's, may I sit at your right hand? And instead, I was the refill guy. Okay, let's give it up for our friends. Thanks so much, y'all. <clears throat> so Jesus is talking to that guy. 
Jesus is talking to the guy on the end, the one who everybody else sees as the least important, and he says, God is watching. Yeah, you got the worst meal. Yeah, nobody's paying attention to you. Yeah, the, the whole society is arranged to put you in your place, quite literally. But there is a God, and he sees what other people do not see. And then Jesus goes on to deal with the heart that says, why are you at the banquet in the first place? Why are you so drawn to the people that everybody else says are so important? Jesus is talking right to our desire to get ahead, to watch out for number one. And that's what makes what Jesus says next so crazy. Look at what he says next. In verse 12 of Luke 14, Jesus said, Jesus said to the host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. Sorry, Aunt Betty, about you not getting to come to Thanksgiving. But it's in the Bible, right? If you do, they may invite you back and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. He says, when you have a banquet, don't invite the important people. Invite those who can't pay you back. Invite the people who can do you no good, the lame and the blind and the poor. Now, after this sermon's over, don't come and invite me and Leslie to dinner. We'll come, but we'll be offended. But no, think about what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, stop living your life as a quid pro quo. Stop trying to make every social advantage that you can. Most of us know exactly what Jesus is getting at here. The people, the truth is, Jesus is talking to people exactly like us. I fight this all the time. I want to be known as a servant more than I want to serve. I want to be known as a kind and generous person more than I want to be kind and generous. And Jesus is saying there is a trick to learning how to lay that kind of life down. Let me ask you a question. If you could get great credit in your life, if you could be notorious for doing really good things in your life, but you really only lived a mediocre life, would you choose that? Or would you choose to really sincerely make a difference in the world and nobody knows it? There's a desire in all of us to be recognized as doing the right thing more than do, doing the right thing. And Jesus is actually saying, you can let go of that. He gives us the key to let go of about that. He, he starts talking about the resurrection of the righteous, which is a weird thing for him to bring up when he's at a banquet talking about a meal, isn't it? All of a sudden, you know, he's talking about table etiquette, then all of a sudden he starts talking about the resurrection. What's he talking about? Well, Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. He's suggesting we abandon this entire system, this entire way of approaching each other. The the resurrection is not just about the process of reversing death. It is that. But this is a form of death too, isn't it? It's a, pro, it's a, a way of reversing injustice. It's about how you, if you, the poor and the disenfranchised and the lame and the weak and the broken, don't have a good seat, there is a God. And this God sees the way that honor is fought for and guarded and protected and pushed to the end of the table, if they're at the table at all. Most of what Jesus says makes no sense outside of the resurrection. I mean, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. This makes no sense unless there will be a day in which God gives honor to those people. And if we don't get this, I don't know how possible it is to actually follow Jesus. Not like Jesus, Not believe in Jesus theoretically with our ideas and our minds, but actually follow Jesus. Because Jesus says things like, blessed are the people everybody else has written off. And everywhere and everyone else says that's not true. Think about this. In the Bible, this is the wind at the back of the people of faith that we we emulate, right? I mean, Moses does not stand up to Pharaoh with nothing more than a burning bush telling him to if there's not this idea that there is a God who is going to set things right. Paul and the early Christians don't stand up to Rome with nothing more than this, like, peasant church at their back if the resurrection hadn't happened. Do you see the power the early Christians had? You see what they found? They knew that even if God allowed them to die, it wouldn't be in vain. They knew that you would never feel the greatest sense of accomplishment 
until you hear from the one who made you, well done. In fact, that's the only thing that can make you feel like you've accomplished anything. Jesus, in this, in this story, is give, setting us free from the needs of accolades by reminding us that even, even if you find yourself in this seat one day, and come on, I'm talking to a room of people who at some point in your life, maybe at this point in your life, have found yourself in this seat for a variety of reasons. Maybe you were on the high-profile page in the Democrat Gazette. Maybe you were interviewed by the news. Maybe you wrote a paper that your peers admired. Maybe you did something really big in your field or your profession, and for one fleeting moment, you were put in this chair. And I know a lot of you are here. I know a lot of us are here, respected in our professions. We, we may not be at this table, this seat yet, but we're on our way up, and we know the people who are. Jesus is saying... Reevaluate this whole system. Not that you don't do well at your job. Of course you do well at your job. But listen, if you live for this system, if you live for this world to make these, take these chairs your kind of life, it's going to be really painful as you slowly begin to slip out of your prime, as you slowly lose the ability to contribute in ways that this table thinks are important. And for some of us, We've never belonged in those seats. Jesus is saying, there is a God who sees everything and will give honor to you one day. You know, all throughout Luke, he emphasizes the resurrection and eating, which is appropriate because that's the way the prophets did. When they talked about the day of the Lord, they talked about it as a banquet. But never more clearly than in the end of the Gospel of Luke when Jesus has raised from the dead and there's disciples that are incredibly disappointed because the person that they believed was the Messiah was crucified naked on a cross. And all of a sudden, Jesus, the risen Jesus, comes up and does this with them. In Luke 24, as the disciples were approaching the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if they were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over, so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. He did what we just did, what he taught us to do, communion. And when they took it, let's read this verse together. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Do you see what happened here? Where's the first place food was eaten in the Bible? Come on, talk to me. Where was it eaten? The Garden of Eden, Genesis. And what happened after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit? Their eyes were open. This is a reversal of the curse. What Jesus did as the resurrection was reversing the fall. He was opening their, ta their eyes, and it happened at the table. What happens next is the book of Acts. What happens next is resurrection. What the Pharisees missed was the, the part of the story that, that resurrection was the forgiveness of sins. Do you realize that, right? You remember when death entered the world? With sin. When God raised Jesus from the dead, it is forgiveness of sins. So everywhere Jesus goes along the way, this is why he eats with prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners and immoral people, because he knows there's nothing God can't resurrect. That's what Pharisees missed out on. This is why re resurrection is a revolutionary doctrine. It means there's not a single sin outside of the grace and power of God's resurrection. What the Sadducees missed out on, or, or rather they very clearly knew what they were missing out on, was what this meant for us now. What this means for us now. Because what you're seeing in the resurrection is the forgiveness of sins, but not just that. What's happening in the story of the resurrection is that there is a day... There is going to be a day where God breaks into human history. And when God does that, everything is going to get turned around. And so what we have to do, people of the resurrection, is ask, if God's reality is really going to crash into earth, which seat do we want to pursue now? That's the point of the resurrection. There's this Christian teacher named Peter Rawlins who was teaching a graduate course on like theology 
in Britain, and some graduate students said, you know, you've talked for a couple hours and you haven't mentioned the resurrection. And they were the kind of graduate students that try to get you. So they said, do you deny the, the resurrection, Peter Rawlins? And he thought about it for a second and he said, I, I do. Every time I walk past hungry people, every time I don't take care of my neighbor, every time I don't watch out for the people who are disenfranchised, every time I don't watch out for the least of these, I deny the resurrection. And I affirm the resurrection every time I stand up for someone on their knees. Because the resurrection has never just been a good idea. It is and always has been a signpost pointing to the way the world would one day be. So when I was uh, at Harding, my buddy and I coached this group of kids. And we, for uh, two years, we coached these group of like eight, nine-year-old boys and we never won one game. Not one. About 18 months into doing this, we decided, you know, more, team morale was low, as you might imagine. So we asked my buddy Datron, who was a Harding uh, power forward, six foot seven, just a giant man, to come and do practice with us. And we could have done the fundamentals. We could have, you know, practiced dribbling and passing because we needed that. But instead, we decided that we would do something else with our 90 minutes of practice. So these kids, for 90 minutes practice, throw in Datron alley-oops, which they were not going to have a lot of game time experience for, or need for. But we did it anyway, and I'd do it again. Because what those kids needed was hope. Because what you practice towards is eventually what you're going to become. This is why the table is so important. It's why communion, every week when we gather for communion, what we're doing is more than just revisiting what the early church did. We're remembering why they did it. Because God has dealt with evil once and for all. The resurrection means God has not, there's not a single sin that God is, has excluded us by. The resurrection means God has defeated sin and death. And and for the Sadducee in us, we need to remember the world is going to one day be a certain way. That greed and violence and oppression and racism are wrong and they will not last because they belong to death and death does not belong. So we eat this meal every week confident that what God did for Jesus, He's going to do for us. It means we live differently in Little Rock and the surrounding area. We take the bread and we take the cup confident that when things look the darkest, hope is just around the corner. We, every Sunday, we are celebrating resurrection around a table because we believe God has the final word and it is a word of life. So in 1990, the Boston Globe ran a story about this couple who had rented out the downtown Chicago Hyatt Hotel and they had spent tens of thousands of dollars on this elaborate wedding banquet. And a week before, the groom backed out. So the family went to get their money back and they said, we're sorry, but we can only give you a small percentage, just a couple thousand dollars of your money back if you don't go ahead and throw this party because it was a deposit. And so... The bride, the jilted bride, started thinking about what she could do with this. About a decade before this moment in her life, she had been homeless. And so she decided that what she would like to do was send out invitations to the downtown Chicago's homeless population. And they came flooding in. In 1990, on a May Saturday night in downtown Chicago... These homeless men and women drank champagne and danced and they ate hors d'oeuvres. In fact, hors d'oeuvres. In fact the bride didn't change anything from the original uh, wedding itself except she changed what they ate. She served boneless chicken in honor of the groom. <laughs> and for one night... What Jesus had in mind, I think, happened in downtown Chicago. This is the kind of table we gather around, where everybody is welcome, where these kinds of tables don't come in to what we do together. When we gather together to take communion, you are doing more than just eating bread and drinking 
grape juice. You are tasting the future of God's good and perfect world. You're not just eating a meal. You are practicing resurrection. I'd like to invite the shepherds to take their places at the aisle, in the aisles right now. If you're here today and you've got stuff going on in your life, you would like uh, some, you know, something coming up next week or you've got something uh, or you had a hard week the week before or you just want these godly guys to pray for you to be a good witness in your community or your neighborhood, they'd love to bless you. Or if you would like to put on Jesus in baptism or you'd like to learn more about Jesus, you can come to me right now while we stand and worship.